earlier we began looking at the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5, began looking at the Sermon on the Mount. I want us to pray that God will help us as we continue our study in looking at the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount. We began first this morning with verse 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Each of these verses pronounces a blessing when certain conditions exist. The blessing that is described here, the blessing is the kingdom of heaven. The thing that must exist before one can experience that blessing of the kingdom of heaven is they must be poor in spirit. For being poor in spirit has reference to being humble. Jesus taught his disciples that unless they humbled themselves and became as a little child, then they would not even enter into the kingdom of heaven. So all of us need to pray that God will help us to humble ourselves because we have to be humble in order to enter into the kingdom of heaven. The second beatitude in verse 4 says, Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Now, the mourning that's under consideration, I believe the primary mourning, there are a lot of different things that cause us to mourn. But I believe that in its context, and as you look at the rest of the Word of God, the main thing Jesus is talking about when he says, Blessed are they that mourn, is those that mourn because of sin in their lives or sin in the lives of others. We as the people of God, we ought to be so burdened when there is sin in our lives that we ought to be mourning. There ought to be a lot of mourning in our nation about the sin of the direction that our nation, the sinful way that our uh, nation is going. The Word of God tells us about Israel of old that they often just pined away in their sins. They felt no guilt about their sins. They could not even blush because of their sin. Well, they certainly were not mourning about their sin if they couldn't even blush about their sin. They, they didn't feel the weight of the sin. They didn't feel the guilt that they ought to feel because of the sin in their lives. But Jesus says that when a child of God feels the conviction of the Holy Spirit and they feel guilty because of sin in their lives and they mourn because of that sin, blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Now, I don't believe it's limited to that. I do believe that is the main teaching here, that when the people of God feel the weight of sin and the conviction of sin, that God will come and comfort them. I'd like to ask that you turn forward in your Bibles just a moment to Luke chapter 4. And uh, there is a prophecy that was made in Isaiah chapter 61 there was a prophecy made and Jesus, while he was here on this earth, Jesus said that this, him speaking right now in Luke 4, he is fulfilling the prophecy that was given back there in Isaiah chapter 61 verses 1, 2, and 3. And it's all about comfort. It's, that, it's the fact that God comforts his people. In, in Luke chapter 4, listen please, beginning in verse 17. Luke chapter 4 beginning in verse 17, the word of God says, And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah, that's Jesus, as he was in the temple, they handed him the book of Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Now, brethren, I want to just stop right there and say that I know Jesus preached to people who were physically poor. But all of these passages that we're going to be looking at, they all parallel the passage in Matthew chapter 5. And when the scripture says here that he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, brethren, the gospel of the kingdom of heaven is preached to those who are poor in spirit. Because it's those who are poor in spirit that are able to enter into the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus says here, I have been anointed to preach the gospel to the poor. 
And then he says, He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted. And what is it in Matthew 5, 3? Blessed are the poor in spirit. And then in Matthew 5, 4, what is it? It's those that are being comforted. And he says, I've been anointed to preach the gospel to the poor. And he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted and to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of the sight of the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Jesus is saying, I am here to fulfill what Isaiah said was going to come. That is the preaching of the gospel of the kingdom of heaven and giving great comfort to those that are broken hearted, the downcast, those that feel that they're mourning because of sin, he comes to comfort them. Go with me to Luke chapter 15. <clears throat> In Luke chapter 15, the whole chapter of Luke 15, there are three different parables given in Luke 15. The first one is about a hundred sheep. And one of those sheep went astray. You know what it's talking about there when it talks about a sheep that went astray? It's talking about a child of God that gets away from God and begins to live a sinful life. And then the shepherd goes after that sheep and begins to bring that sheep back. And it says in, in uh, Luke chapter 15 verse 7 after, well let me read 6 and 7. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. Brethren, do you know what kind of sinner it is that repents? It's a sinner that is mourning because of their sin. And Jesus in all of this chapter, he's talking about those that repent because of their sin. Those that have been mourning because of their sin. I'm going to come down to the, the middle part, or really the third parable in this chapter is the parable, uh, we call it the parable of the prodigal son. I want you to come down to verse 18. I want you to see the mourning. In fact, I want you to see two things in this passage about the prodigal son. What does Matthew 5, 3 talk about? Blessed are the what? The poor in spirit. What's Matthew 5, 4 talking about? Those that are mourn. Now brethren, if you look at the prodigal son, you'll see that eventually in his life, he reached that point, he had gone out proud, hadn't he? When he left his father's house, he had gone out proud and full of arrogance. And he went out and he wasted his father's goods and riotous living. But he reached a point when he went down, down, down. And then finally the word of God teaches us that he began to be humble again and he began to, to mourn because of his condition. In Matthew chapter 15, I'm sorry, Luke, Luke chapter 15 and verse 18, the word of God says, the prodigal son said, I will rise and go to my father. I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. Do you hear what he's doing right there? Do you know what he's doing? He's mourning. Why is he mourning? Not because he's lost a friend or son he's mourning because of the sin in his life he's mourning because he has sinned against heaven he's mourning because he has offended his father he said I've sinned against heaven and in thy sight and I'm no more worthy to be called thy son what was he right there he was very what humble. very humble I'm no more worthy to be called thy son make me as one of thy hired servants and he arose and came to his father but when he was yet a Great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Do you know what the Word of God tells us in Matthew 5, 3 and 4? Blessed are, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 5, 4 says, Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. You know what this prodigal son was doing? He was humble, he was poor in spirit, and he was mourning. And as he returned to his father, what did his father do? His father comforted him. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. I believe with all of my heart, if America were to fall on her knees today and cry out to God and say, God, we have sinned against you. We have we have gone so far away from what your word teaches and we fall on our faces. I believe God in his mercy and his grace will begin to comfort those that mourn. Yeah. Blessed are they that mourn for they shall be comforted. 
You can't wait until the judgments of God come and God begins to pour out his wrath and feel the comfort of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does not comfort when God begins to carry out his judgment. God is a great comforter. We mentioned just a moment ago this coach that has just gotten killed and his son that's in, been life flighted to Augusta. But there's lots of people that are going to be mourning tonight. And though that mourning is somewhat different than I think the, the text specifically implies, did you know the comforter is going to be all around this city tonight? The comforter is going to be all around this city because God is the God of all comfort. You're, you hear those words? God is the God of all comfort. It doesn't matter whether it's the comforting because of sin or the com comforting because of sickness or the comforting because of pain or the comforting because of death. It doesn't matter what the comforting is. God is the God of all comfort. Let's look at that in your Bibles, please. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And I want you to remember now that the text in Matthew 5, 4 says, Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. And I believe that the main mourning there is those that are mourning because of sin. And I believe the main comforter there is the comfort of the Holy Spirit. But I also believe, listen carefully now, I believe that when a born again child of God is a part of the church of Jesus Christ, and they begin to mourn because of their sin. And they feel convicted because of their sin. And they repent because of their sin. I believe God is going to comfort them. But I believe the church also will, will join together in comforting them. Why? Why? Well, I'll tell you one of the reasons is because every one of us has been there where we have sinned. And we have seen the mercy and the grace of God. And we've seen the mercy and grace of God's people. So because we have sinned and we've seen the comforter, we are able to comfort those who go contrary to God's word and then repent and turn from their evil ways. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, listen please to verses 3 and 4 as we think about blessed are they that mourn for they shall be comforted. The word of God says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 3, Blessed be the God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort. Do you hear that? Did you know I cannot comfort you unless God blesses me to comfort you? And nobody else can comfort you unless God blesses them to comfort you. He, he is the God of all comfort. Verse 4 says, Who comforteth us, that is God comforteth us in all our tribulation that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. He's saying God comforts us so that we, then we can go and comfort other people. Yeah. Have you ever had anybody come and comfort you and it was such an example to you that it kind of motivated you to then go and comfort other people? Have you ever been in trouble and you needed comfort and and ever been sorrowing and, and people came to you and they wrapped their arms around you and they comforted you and then when other people were in trouble that you realized, you know, I've been right where they are. Not exactly the same situation, but you could go and you could comfort them with the same comfort wherewith you were comforted. Isn't that amazing? And the only reason you're able to go and comfort other people is because God enables you to go and comfort other people. Let's go back to Matthew 5 now. I want us to look at the next statement that Jesus makes. We looked only at two so far. Blessed are they, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Now listen to verse 5. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Now, first of all, I want us to think about what does that mean? Blessed are the meek. Now the promise is they shall inherit the earth. We need to look at both of those statements. I think probably of all the different Beatitudes, this is the one that's the hardest to understand. First of all, I think that many times we don't really understand what it means to be meek. And then secondly, we don't understand what he's talking about when Jesus says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. We need, to, we need to understand both those statements. What does it mean to be the meek? What does it mean to inherit the earth? 
Let's take first, blessed are the meek. Go with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 11. We find that our great example, the one who is above all and the one who is the perfect example for all that is right and good, that one perfect example is Jesus Christ. And the Word of God tells us that Jesus said about himself in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 29, the Word of God says in Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. Now he says, I am meek, I am meek and lowly in heart. Rather than there's a major difference in meekness and weakness. Jesus was not weak. Never in the life of Jesus Christ was he ever weak. The word meek means to be gentle and to be kind and to be slow to anger. It means also to trust in God rather than carrying out your own judgment. Everybody follow that? I'll tell you some people that were meek. The Bible tells us that Moses was, had more meekness than all the men upon the face of the earth during his lifetime. Moses was a man who was meek. Was Moses weak? Absolutely not. He wasn't afraid of the Egyptians. He wasn't afraid of the children of Israel. Do you see meekness in the life of Moses? Do you see his gentleness? Do you see his kindness? Do you see that whereas most people would have said about the children of Israel, God cut them off and cast them away forever. Not Moses. You know what it was that motivated Moses to say, Lord, Block me out of, thy bo out of thy book, but spare the children of Israel. You know what it was that motivated him to say, Block me out of thy book? Was that weakness? Oh, no, brethren. I doubt there are many of us that could ever honestly, truthfully say about someone other than our own family, Lord, I love them so much, and then instead of blotting them out of your book, I ask you to block me out of your book. A man that, that should have almost felt in his heart and would have naturally felt, Lord, send your wrath upon them. And yet he was meek, he was kind, he was gentle, he was forgiving, and he was full of meekness. Also Stephen, while he was being stoned to death, while Stephen was being stoned, he made this statement. He said, Lord... Lay not this sin to their charge. Right? And that's a strong man that would say, Lord, here's people that are stoning him to death. Just like those people with uh, Moses, they desired to kill him. Well, this isn't just people that desired to kill Stephen. These are people that were killing Stephen. And instead of Stephen saying, God, render judgment in their lives, he was meek. He was kind. He was gentle. He was forgiving. He trusted in God. And he said, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. You know what that was? That was meekness. When Jesus, Jesus says in Matthew eleven twenty nine 29, that we just read, Jesus says, I am meek and lowly. He proved how meek and lowly he was when he went to the cross of Calvary. He proved how humble he was. Was Jesus poor in spirit? Yes, he was. Was he humble? Absolutely. Was he in the kingdom of heaven? He's the king of the kingdom of heaven. He's the one that set a perfect example about being poor in spirit. He's the one that set a perfect example about mourning because of sin. And he, not his own, but the sin of his people. And he also is the perfect example of one that was meek. And when Jesus was being crucified on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That's a strong man, not a weak man, but that's meekness. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Are you able to do that? Are you able to do that when people are persecuting you? Well, Jesus says you need to be there where you can bless them that curse you. He's going to come on down in the rest of this Sermon on the Mount and explain all that. Bless them that what? Bless them that curse you. Do you know what it takes to bless those who curse you? It takes meekness. You know what it, is, what it takes for you not to want vengeance? It takes meekness. 
You know what it is for you not to carry out vengeance? It takes meekness. We need more meekness. We need meekness. Blessed are the meek. Now listen. <laughs> Let's go to the second part of that now. What's the promise? To the meek. Blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. <laughs> I hear carnal minded people talking about that pretty often. Oh man, I'm going to inherit the earth. I'm going to get the whole earth because I'm meek. Listen brethren, to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Now, now Jesus emphatically states here, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Now we need to know what that earth is. We need to be able from the scriptures to be able to identify what is that earth that's under consideration. Well, we're going to begin in the Old Testament and go through the New Testament. And I pray that God will bless you to see what is the earth that you will inherit if you are meek. Back up in your Bibles, first of all, to the book of Psalm. Look at Psalm chapter 37. Psalm 37, beginning in verse 8. Brethren, if you'll follow this carefully as we go through the Old Testament, by the time we get to the New Testament, I think you'll understand what the earth is that we will inherit if we're meek. In uh, Psalm 37, beginning in verse 8, the Word of God says, Cease from anger. <laughs> what is meekness? Can you have anger and meekness at the same time? Uh-uh. No, see? He's leading up to inheriting the earth. Cease from anger. What if Stephen, what if Stephen had been filled, in, uh, filled with anger towards those people who were stoning him to death? Would he have prayed that prayer? No. He had ceased from anger, hadn't he? What about Jesus when he's hanging on the cross? Had he ceased from anger? Yes, he had ceased from anger. What about Moses? Had he ceased from anger? Yes. The Word of God says now in Psalm 37 beginning verse 8, Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil, for evildoers shall be cut off. But those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. You hear the wording there? Now watch this carefully. <laughs> Stop being angry. They're going to be cut off. But those that wait upon the Lord shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall not be. Yea, thou shalt diligently consider his place, and it shall not be. But the meek shall inherit the earth, and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. Now he's going to give you a little key right there. He gives you a little key right there that begins to open the door about what this inheriting the earth is all about. What's he combined with inheriting the earth in verse 11? Peace, yeah. But the meek shall inherit. Now, see, this was this didn't begin to be true over there in in uh, Matthew five four. It's always been true. The meek shall inherit the earth. He said, "Now, what was the earth? Let me just stop right here a minute. Was there an earth that they were looking forward to? Was there an earth that a literal earth that they wanted back there in the Old Testament? What was what was the earth? What was the land that they wanted? What was the promised land in the Old Testament?" It was Canaan land, a land flowing with milk and honey, a, man, a land where God poured out his blessings. But listen, brethren, people that have never been in that literal land of Canaan can still be in this earth that we're talking about. They can have this peace and righteousness and joy in the Holy Ghost. They can inherit the earth. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Now go to Isaiah. Follow this carefully now. Go to Isaiah chapter 57. Look in your Bibles at Isaiah chapter 57. We're going to hear now a prophecy by Isaiah about the coming of the, of the earth that you'll be able to inherit if you are meek. Everybody hear what I just said? We're going to look in Isaiah chapter 57 at the coming of the earth that can be inherited if you're meek. What did Jesus say in Matthew 5? 5, 5, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. What is that earth? In Isaiah 57, listen please to verse 13. First he gives the negative about those that don't do right. He says, when thou criest, let thy companies deliver thee. But the wind shall carry them all away. Vanity shall take them. But he that putteth his trust in me shall possess the land. Shall what? 
possess the land and shall inherit my holy mountain. Now you're beginning to get a little clearer picture. What did he call it? What did he connect with it in uh, in in the book of uh, uh, Psalms? What did he connect with it? Peace. Peace. What does he connect with it now? Mountain the mountain, the holy mountain. He calls it the possessing the land. You see, it's, it's the promised land. You'll be able to possess the land and you'll go and inherit his holy mountain. Now go to Isaiah 65. This is going to be the, the clincher right here that opens up the New Testament to you. In Isaiah 65, starting in verse 17, God is speaking about the coming of Christ and the coming of the kingdom of heaven. In Isaiah chapter 65, Beginning in verse 17, he says, For behold, this is Isaiah chapter 65, verse 17, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. Now, what is that new heavens and a new earth that Isaiah is prophesying? It's the coming of the kingdom of heaven. I create, a new, he I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered, nor come into mind. What is that former? That's the old Jerusalem. He says, I'm going to create a new Jerusalem. He says, but, but be ye glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem a rejoicing and her people a joy. He's talking about the new Jerusalem. Watch this now. Verse 19. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. And the voice of weeping shall be no more heard in her, nor the voice of crying. This new Jerusalem that Isaiah says is coming when Christ came, that new Jerusalem is the new heaven and a new what? Earth. Earth. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the what? The earth. Go with me now to Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21. I want you to see this new heaven and new earth now. Because you can inherit the earth. But if you think you're going to get 400 acres or... A fancy house, you've become carnal minded, you've missed the point, that's not what he's telling you. But there's an earth better than that earth, there's a land better than this natural land, Amen. there's a house better than this natural house. It says in Revelation chapter 21 and verse 1, John saw the fulfillment of what Isaiah prophesied in Isaiah 65, 17 through 19. Uh, John, the apostle in Revelation 21, he says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, a new earth, a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem. Now, so a lot of people think this New Jerusalem is eternal heaven. <laughs> Brethren, it can't be. If you'll read the scriptures, it can't be. He says, I saw the holy city. It's a holy city. Remember that because this ten times in the next in this chapter and the next chapter, ten times it talks about this holy city, New Jerusalem. We're going to see what you have to do to enter this city, okay? This holy city, this New Jerusalem. And now John saw the holy city, New Jerusalem. What was it doing? Coming down from God out of heaven. You see where it came from? Yeah. It came out of what? Can it be heaven if it came out of heaven? No. Where did it come from? It came down from God. Therefore it's called the kingdom of God. Out of heaven. Therefore it's called the kingdom of heaven. It came down from God. Out of heaven. Prepared, uh, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Now what do you have to do to enter in that new heaven and new earth? Well, Matthew 5, 4 says if blessed. I'm sorry, Matthew 5, 5 says blessed are the meek. Blessed are the meek. For well, they shall inherit the earth. This is the earth that they inherit. Yeah. The meek shall inherit the kingdom of heaven, the new Jerusalem. And he tells you what you have to do in verse 14. Uh, Revelation 22, not 21 now, but Revelation 22 now. Verse 14, blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. What do you have to do to enter into this city? What do you have to do to enter this city? You have to keep his commandments. What does Jesus tell us in Matthew 7? In the Sermon on the Mount that you have to do in Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Same thing he tells us in the closing of the whole Bible right here. 
You have to do the commandments of God if you're going to enter into this city. You want to inherit the earth? I want to inherit the earth. <laughs> Brother, I sure don't want to pay taxes. I'm sick and tired of paying taxes. Uh, you know, if somebody were to give me a thousand acres, I'd have to say, I'm sorry, I can't take it. Because I can't pay the taxes on it. Oh, but we have an earth that the government can't tax. We have a new heaven and a new earth that the government can't touch. Wherefore, seeing we have a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us serve God with reverence and godly fear. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. I've got to go to one other one. Turn back in your Bibles to, to Matthew chapter uh, Matthew chapter 5. Let's at least touch on one other one. Matthew 5 verse 6. <clears throat> Matthew 5 verse 6. And this one is really, I think, uh, one of the easiest them all, of them all. I may be mistaken. But Matthew 5 verse 6, the Word of God says, Jesus says, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness for they shall be filled now what's the blessing that's promised they shall be what filled filled, filled with what righteousness. filled with righteousness yes what are they hungering and thirsting after hungering and thirsting after righteousness that's what they're after that's what they're seeking it's like the psalmist says, As the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee. Brethren, we ought to be seeking righteousness, hungering and thirsting after righteousness. Now brethren, there are two righteousnesses that every one of us ought to be hungering and thirsting after. First of all, you need to be hungering and thirsting after living a righteous life. You need to be living a righteous life. Doing right. Let me just put it that way because righteous is a long word. If you don't know what doing right means, <laughs> I, every child ought to know what it means to do right. Do right. That's all. You need to be seeking to do what's right. Every day, in every situation, do right. Do what's right. But you also need to be seeking his righteousness. In fact, if you look at Matthew 6, 33, look at Matthew 6, 33. Matthew 6, 33 explains Matthew 5, 6. Matthew 6, 33, the word of God says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. What are you supposed to seek first? The kingdom of God and his righteousness. There you are. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Now if you're seeking it first, guess what you're doing? Give me the wording from Matthew 5, 6 that parallels with the wording in uh, Matthew 6, 33. What's the wording in Matthew 5, 6? Hungering and thirsting after righteousness. Now what's he say over here in Matthew 6, 33? Seek ye first. That's going to take priority above everything else. Hungering and thirsting after righteousness. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all, and all these things shall be added unto you. Everything you need, everything you need will be provided if you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Blessed, blessed, blessed are they which do hunger. And thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Have you ever been filled with his righteousness? <laughs> I'll tell you what we've probably been filled with too much is our own righteousnesses. That's what the Pharisees were full of was their own righteousnesses. They were self-righteous. They were full of themselves. But I want to pray that God will help us all tonight that we might leave here with a great desire to hunger and thirst and seek first His righteousness. May God help us is my prayer for Christ's sake. Amen.